name is Lynn Teeger. I'm the president of the Rockland Republican Women's Leadership Council. We started the organization last year for the first time in many years, and we had a great year last year. Every single month we have a different speaker, um, and at the end of the year we have a, um, a dinner where we honor uh, women, we call it the Distinguished Women of Distinction Award. And last year we had Deneen Borelli from Fox News, who also wrote a book called Blacklash. And we also had we also had Betsy McCoy, who is also pretty famous, has been on the news, and wrote a book about Obamacare. It's a great evening. We have a great bunch of women working with us, and we have membership applications on the table if anyone would like. Only $25 a year. You can't put Welcome, that anywhere. Welcome, and thank you all for coming and being part of this evening. It's really evenings like this and your interest in them that represent the best of America. There have been a lives. number of missteps that have occurred over the years. Um, some of us have spoken very loud and clear about not taking those that path. The path was taken, so be it. Uh, so we are, we are where we are. So we need to take immediate aggressive action to turn this county around. Financially, I do not believe the average person understands how bad what we are. We oh, keep hearing our administration telling us everything's wonderful. It's getting better. You've read, you've read this no. in the paper. Uh, meanwhile, our deficit went from $96 million to $127 million in one year. One year. $32 million. Now, put it in perspective, when I did my, my uh, minority just in 2009, You'll hear a passing reference to a deficit of nine million dollars. Four years ago. But what scares me is how fast we've gone from fifty-four to eighty to ninety-six to one hundred twenty-seven in the last four years. So we're in a crisis. We need crisis management in institution of institution. Uh, this county has been my life for a long time, and uh, I'm not willing to give it up. And I'm not willing to give it up uh, in any way, shape, or form. And we need to make sure that we can stabilize the taxes. We need to increase the tax. We need to increase the revenue and decrease the operating expense. Financial <coughs> models are based on operate, expense and, and revenue, and there are only certain ways you can do it: either cut things in people, or you raise revenue. And some of the ideas, along with Ed's ideas, is to bring in economic development that is appropriately suited for our town in Orange Town, not just take and mash things in just so we can say we have business here. We have to make sure it com it's compliant with our rules and regulations, it, it works for the town, it, it, it makes sure that it's profitable. Uh, I've already met with a couple of people that st are starting an operational business in the United States, they're from Ireland, and what they do is they have a, um, what they call net watch. They actually uh, have cameras, they watch various warehouses and with security cameras and uh, 24 by 7. So if somebody tries to break in, they actually have a voice that comes on, hey, you get away from that building, we're calling the police right now. So it kind of, it's kind of a, a security we, we can no longer afford to lose. We need to gain. So my job as the, as the Orange Town Supervisor is not only to bring business in, but retain the businesses that we already have, to make sure we're attractive enough to them that they always want to stay in the town. I just promise you is that Building code enforcement is required in the town of Orangetown. Multi-single-family -sing homes will not become multi-family dwellings. And for two reasons. Number one, tax rateables, and number two, safety. And as Ed spoke about, I'm on the same page. We cannot have our firemen, our EMS people, our ambulance drivers going into a building that's supposed to be a single-family home and find out when we get in there there's a problem. So we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that all our code, building codes are enforced to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you. The Stony Point unfortunately has a poor reputation as far as it's business friendly, uh, how business friendly it is. It's not too business friendly. We have um, the most onerous, I believe, I believe the most onerous fees and the least fluid planning and zoning process. Uh, this has not really been addressed in any previous regime. So with uh, the emergency we're facing with taxes that have doubled due to um, various closures of plants and we're in a, in a you know, fiscal crisis like a lot of other municipalities, 
not that we're not in debt as um, the county is, but our taxpayers are hurting. You knock on the doors, it almost breaks your heart. 75% of the people at least are, they, they have the same thing, they're, they're suffering, they wish they could leave, some of them. They can't even sell the house if they wanted to because no one wants to buy the house with such taxes to come. Now, we can do more and we will do more to make government more efficient. That can at least hold the taxes steady for a while. Uh, we have to take an aggressive approach to that and, and do things that haven't been done. Uh, I know there's only so far really you can go with the laws in New York. You can't like cut everyone's salary or fire people, too many people. Not that that's what we would even, you know, that doesn't sound like a nice thing to do anyway, but you have to, uh, you can't really with the government laws, it's limited. But we can do, we can make it more efficient to hold taxes steady um, and then aggressively pursue business and uh, good business, make Stony Point a friendly place to do business finally and begin to uh, replace our base of taxes. And uh, there are some potential projects out there that could bring in uh, a windfall, hopefully. And, and if Mr. St. Lawrence is reelected, we're going to have more of the same. Taxes spiraling out of control. No sense of responsibility whatsoever in town hall. Incredible astronomical levels of downzoning. Uh, the worst record of any town in the, in the state in terms of fiscal health. The worst. So in Ramapo, you have the worst. Out of 932 towns, Ramapo is rated 932, ranked 932, in a county that's at the very bottom of the, uh, of the barrel in terms of fiscal responsibility. So, I mean, fiscal health. So you can see that there has never been a more important time to have new leadership. I have a lot of experience working with budgets and getting tough situations through the through the through tight times and then flourishing afterwards. That's that's my job. That's what I get paid to do. And that's what Ramapo needs. Ramapo also needs zoning enforcement. Because it's gonna knock out a lot of I mean, maybe we'll have to sell the stadium. And that stadium is sixty three million dollars of taxpayer money. Sixty three million dollars which accrues interest over time and it was taken it was taken from the taxpayers in a, in a sort of a tricky way by telling the taxpayers you're not going to have to pay for it, we're going to pay for it with our uh, money. My wife and I raised seven children in Havistraw, five daughters, so I have a very sharply tuned BS antenna. <laughs> uh, the reason I got into uh, this race, which a year ago, if anybody told me I'd be doing it, I would have said they were crazy. Uh, the reason I got into it is because too many things in town government got me upset. I live in the town of Havistro. We heard some of the other candidates talk about the power of the one-party rule. Well, there's not a town in Rockland that can compare with Havistro. Havistro hasn't elected a Republican to anything, anything, in over 75 years. When you talk about one-party rule, Havistro has nothing, or, or I should say, Cuba and Venezuela and Detroit had nothing on Havistro. Mm -hmm. Havistro is one party government. And the people suffer for it. Um, and many of them suffer unknowingly. In, in the time that I've been campaigning, as I go about town, I'm surprised at the amount of people who are irate about the, uh, the way they're treated by the current government. Business owners who are afraid to put a sign up in, in, on their property or in their window because of what will happen to them if they do it. And this is the United States in the year 2013. It, it's, uh, it's not Germany in 1938. It's New York State. Uh, so one of the reasons I got in was because I wanted to do something about one party rule. Another reason I got in was because of the desalinization plan. I told the, a person I met at a, at a deli, I said, I thought it was the dumbest idea he ever heard. And he told me I was giving dumb ideas a bad name. That it's such a stupid idea in a county that gets over 45 inches of rainfall a year to build a desalination plant. 
He couldn't believe anybody was that stupid. It's one party rule. Nobody ever mentioned anything against it. And uh, but, but the problem I hear, the biggest complaint I hear, like everybody else running for office, is taxes. I talk to people in their homes and while they're shopping, and they say taxes are driving them out of the town house. They can't afford it. Uh, I think there's something inherently wrong with the attitude that our elected officials have about taxes. And one of the things I want, which uh, Ed Day wants also, is I want term limits. Every problem we face at the town level, county level, state level, national level, can be traced to professional career politicians. We didn't create any of those problems. Professional politicians created them. I'd like to put term limits in and get rid of Make politics a part-time job, not a career Thank job. Thank you for having me here tonight. I, I really welcome the forum. Um, I am running for the office of Rockland County Clerk. And what I've noticed in campaigning and going around is a lot of people don't realize what exactly does the Rockland County Clerk do. Nobody seems to know. Well, I'll tell you, they, they are the keeper of the records of the County of Rockland. They are the passports, they are the gun permits, they are the notaries, they keep the notaries. Um, a lot of times in that office, that may be the first office you go to that may have corruption. And the reason I say that is, long time ago, when mortgages and deeds were first put in place, if you're having a mortgage and a deed in your, in your house, you would go ahead and it would be put in a ledger and it would be handwritten. We upgraded and then we went into computers. After we had the computer system put in, currently and as we speak right now, there is actually no way of telling in our current computer system on how to go ahead and say you change your deed five times in one week. There is actually no way of us telling they take your paper, they stamp it in. They take your paper, they stamp it in. But if they go ahead and they do this, there is no way that we in the county can actually find out that somebody has just changed their deed five times. And that leads usually to fraud. And when it leads to fraud, it can be mortgage fraud. You can end up with two first mortgages. And what I want to do is put a data mining program in so that we can pick up the anomaly and through transparency try to prevent the 1993, fraud. I saw this village going one direction, which was down. And I said, now is the time for me to step forward. Ran for office. I won. I was in office for eight years. I took over a village that was virtually bankrupt. Six months into the fiscal year, when I got into office, we didn't have money to buy. To, to pay bills, we didn't have money to pay salaries. Six months. Eight years later, I left office. I left the village with the highest credit credit rating in history. A W A, and a surplus of six point three million dollars from a bankrupt, almost bankrupt village. I'm a fiscal conservative, proud Republican, proud conservative. That's the way my father taught me. So, I am standing here tonight to tell you that we in the village of Spring Valley and all of Spring Valley, we're at a critical juncture. And if we don't win this election, all my political colleagues, I, I listen to you carefully, but I said this village of Spring Valley, if we don't win this election, I can assure you the next five or ten years, Spring Valley will be no more.